Hello, hi, hi, hi. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Um, so this is actually my first ever talk at a design conference. And, oh, thanks. <laughs> Everyone has been super welcoming so far, and I've enjoyed talking to everyone. And yeah, I'm totally free to chat afterwards about anything in my talk. Um, I'm available on the Twitters. I just forgot the clicker, so I'm going to go grab that. So how do I advance? Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about designing for safety, principles, and practices. Yes, that's the name of the talk. Um, and it's something that is really, really valuable to me and has sort of been the basis of my product design careers thus far. But just a quick intro. It's a really pink slide. Sorry if that's blinding. Um, so I'm Kat Pukui. I That's my handle across the interwebs, except for GitHub, because I like messed up my personal branding. My GitHub is actually a Catmeister, but around the Twitter and whatever, I'm Kat Pukui. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yes, yeah, so I mentioned that I'm a pro designer at GitHub, and I've been here for three years. My anniversary is on Pi Day, which seems really fitting. I'm a general nerd. Um, just for a sense of that, what that means, it'll be my 10th Comic Con in July. So there's that. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> We're nerds. Um, and I really, really, really love online communities. Um, my first like memory of an online community is Neopets. Um, yeah! Uh, that's where I learned to code. I made some websites with uh, really crappy iframes for my Neopets. Um, I had their whole backstories, photos, things that I made in Photoshop. It was lovely. Um, from there, MySpace, Zanga, LiveJournal. Um, these days, Discord. Um, but I've always felt like I could explore my identity in these spaces um, without risking my personal safety. And you know, it got me through a lot of those angsty high school times when I could just like blog something on Zanga and have like Nirvana MIDI track playing in the background. <laughs> those were really good times. Yeah, so I mentioned that I work at GitHub. Um, some of you might think of this as like the peak Silicon Valley tech company. You probably know that maybe some of the engineers at your companies or wherever um, work on GitHub. Code, 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 version control, blah, 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 blah. Um, sort of like sharing like a Google Doc or whatever. Um, and you might not think of product design because it's super utilitarian. Um, whenever I say I work at GitHub, they're like, oh, are you an engineer? And I'm like, no, I'm just a nerdy product designer. Um, but this talk is not about code and design, so don't have to worry about that. Um, you might also think of us as like a sticker company. We give out so many stickers. Oh my god. And it's amazing. Um, we have an in-house graphic design team and animation team. Uh, they don't just make stickers, but they, we, you know, they attribute to our amazing branding. Um, this is an Octocat. Her name is Mona Lisa, and she has this like, entire backstory. Um, so no, we're not just a sticker company. We're actually an amazing community. We're the largest developer community with 31 million developers um, collaborating on inner and open source software. Um, last year, I think there was a total of 96 million repositories created, repositories being a project that anyone can collaborate with on GitHub. Um, I put an asterisk there because we say developers, but honestly, the reason why communities are so successful is because of all of the other people, like designers, lawyers, researchers, and students attributing to the code as well. So I wanted to add that in, especially because I'm sure there's plenty of you out here who have used GitHub as well, in attribution. Um, yeah, so I mentioned the communities. The thing that I love the best about GitHub is our open source presence. And if you're not familiar with open source, it's really just a bunch of people all over the world collaborating on software together uh, based on this culture that um, an open internet is going to um, push the boundaries of technology and the internet. So there's stuff like React, which millions of developers rely on as their front end infrastructure. Um, so I could go and fork this today if I wanted to change something, call it like cats crappier React, and I could totally do that because it's all on GitHub and it's free. Um, Microsoft open sourced their 
uh, text editor, Visual Studio, the visual text editor, which is insane. A lot of people, especially people that are early on in their careers, have been relying on this, and it's all on GitHub. I could fork this and make cat studio code and push that out there, and it would be free, too. Um, also, like a lot of governments contribute back to open source on GitHub. NASA's like algorithms for um, what they use to put the Mars rover on Mars like is on GitHub for some reason. Um, like if you have some like billions of dollars laying around, you could totally use their code and do that too. Um, lots of other great presences that contribute back to open source because we all believe that contributing together, collaborating together, is going to create a more open internet. Um, this is one of my favorite projects that's on GitHub. It's called the Human Utility Project. Uh, all of the collaboration happens there. People have been helping to donate um, money to pay off other people's utility bills. And because it's on GitHub, let's say if you did not want, if you wanted to um, expand this to other cities, not just Detroit, you could totally do that because all of the code is there. It's all, you know, it's all free. And people around the world can contribute back. Um, and of course, there's always like silly stuff too. For some reason, someone made like a Windows 95 emulator that you can download. I don't know why you would ever do that, but it's there and it works. Uh, it says, yes, it's the full thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, and this is just a, like a personal plug. This is what I use GitHub for. I use it because like people keep asking me, where did you go on your last Tokyo trip? I'm like, I'm going to make a GitHub repo and put every single restaurant I went to, and you can just download it for yourself so I don't have to keep telling you. So shameless plug for myself, at Catmeister on GitHub. Um, yeah, and I just love the fact that open source powers the te technology that we all rely on, whether we realize it or not. So 86% of the world's smartphones rely on Android, which was actually built off of Linux, the Linux kernel, which is all open source and was created as a way to um, you know, offer a free, uh, I guess like software, not software, like powering computers, which is insane. Um, that's also on GitHub. And I think it really makes sense for me loving online communities and feeling that sense of uh, progression on the internet to be joining these two teams at GitHub. So these are two teams that I lead product design on, community and safety and open source economy. Um, open source economy deserves like other whole talk, so maybe, maybe next year, but today I'm gonna focus on community and safety. So this is our team logo that I made. Um, the engineering manager on our team has this amazing cute cutie pit bull named Scout. Um, and we think that he stands for outstanding online citizenship and a positive outlook on life. So um, I actually have like a bunch of stickers of this too. I said we're not a sticker company, but maybe we are. Um, so please find me after and I will give you one. Yeah, so what do I do at GitHub then on community and safety? Well, I design features and systems for users and communities to feel safe. So I make sure that users feel like they can safely participate in communities, and I make sure that communities feel like they can have a presence without um, people coming in and abusing the code, abusing the people that maintain it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I often collaborate with not just other designers and engineers, but our legal team, platform health, um, our terms of service support folks, security, et cetera. And um, one part of keeping our users safe, though, is being able to identify, close out, and prevent abuse vectors. Um, so what do I mean by abuse vectors? This is sort of like the uh, definition that I've cultivated over the three years that I've been working at GitHub, but I've been defining it as unwanted, targeted misuse of technology, often in ways that are unaccounted for. And to break that down, um, I really like viewing abuse through the taxonomy of content. It's gonna, yeah, so offensive, mean comments, racist, sexist slurs, explicit content, and violent threats. Um, on the other side, you can view it as behavior, dogpiling, meaning uh, when something gets shared on like 4chan or Reddit, um, suddenly everyone in that thread comes in and tries to comment about the same thing. That's what dogpiling is. Doxing, so that's exposing private information, um, usually in 
fortune thread um, so that it's easier. It's oftentimes it's just like an email or contact information that already exists, but because it's shared in a space where people are, are actively and intentionally trying to abuse, um, you, can, you can imagine the consequences there. Swatting, um, this, was, this has been on the rise where, uh, especially, oh, this happened on Twitch maybe? Um, someone was in the middle of a Twitch stream and someone actually called the FBI um, and told them, gave them the address of this person and be like, hey, you need to go check out this person. Um, they are a criminal or whatever. So FBI shows up, uh, knocks on the doors, some like shoot dogs, which is unfortunate, and tried to arrest them on the spot. Someone has actually been killed from this, um, and that is just one type of behavior. It's definitely on the more intense end. Um, stalking and ongoing harassment. And I really like this taxonomy that Sarah Jong bring, brings up in her book, Internet of Garbage. Highly recommend checking it out. Um, just gonna throw some more, more stats at you. 41% uh, of Americans have been personally subjected to harassing behavior online, and an even larger share, 66%, has witnessed these behaviors directed at others. That is a very high number, and something that's really important to note about the 66% is there have been studies showing that just witnessing negative behaviors, not even being involved in them, can make you feel unsafe on a platform too. So one in five Americans um, have been subjected to more severe forms. So that's um, physical threats, harassment over a sustained period, sexual harassment, or stalking. These are all from Pew Research Center that is very focused on that, so highly recommend checking them out too. And um, this is a quote that really sticks with me a lot. It's, many want technology firms to do more, but they are divided on how to balance free speech and safety issues online. I think this, is, this does a good job of capturing the essence of tech inclusivity ethics and privacy today. Um, I think these are definitely sentiments that a lot of people have but don't know how to move forward because they don't have a lot of um, product engineering and design leads who are um, really deeply focused on this problem. And this is definitely one of the first principles that I've had to learn while working at GitHub and it's that any feature can be abused, any feature, and it will be abused. Something that I ask myself every time I design is, how could this feature be used to harm someone? It's absolutely crucial. And when you think about online abuse, maybe some of you are thinking um, giant social platforms where the incentive to engage in a community is to you know, exchange ideas, talk, um, have conversations. But it turns out that if there is a text box anywhere on your site, or there's any chance of just any user-to-user -user contact, or uh, yeah, contact and interaction, you should definitely care. So this is one of my ex-colleagues. Um, she tweeted this not too long ago. It turns out that she was experiencing an abuse vector on Google Drive um, that her abusive ex was still controlling. So he would add photos into the drive, um, so she would get the notification, right? See whatever those things. And even just saying, hey, I'm here, and I have control over the content that you see is really abusive. And it makes you feel like you're not in control. It's super bad. I think um, Google support came back and was like, yes, this is a bug. But that's something that should have been accounted for, right? Um, PayPal, you send money to people. How could that be? How could that go wrong? Um, it turns out this um, trash human um, sent $14, thank you, and 88 cents to a journalist of Jewish descent, Talia Lavin. Um, for those that are not familiar with this, um, 14 is it, 14 stands for 14 words in a white supremacist mantra, and 88 stands for um, so eight is uh, H is the eighth letter in the alphabet, 88HH, Hail Hitler. Um, so he sent her that money. And sometimes you wouldn't have ever expected, I, like, I definitely wouldn't have expected that to happen, but it does. Um, luckily, PayPal suspended him over that. 
Oh man, have, do you know where I'm going with this one? Um, <laughs> so it turns out cyber flashing is pretty easy to do on Dropbox still, or not Dropbox, AirDrop still. Um, it's easy because if you switch the setting even just once from like contacts only to everyone, like maybe you just wanted to send something to a coworker or whatever, and you forgot to switch it back, and there's like no um, consent there, whatever, uh, anyone can send you anything. And this often happens on like crowded trains, but this also happened on like airplanes, and they, <laughs> they find who is sending these eggplants. It's horrible. <laughs> um, and I don't think. Last I checked in this article, um, Apple doesn't have any plans to address that, so hopefully they do. Um, no eggplants, please. Ah, do you all have these things in your home? I, I'm guilty too. I have a Google Home Mini, because sometimes when you come home from a long day of work, you just want to say, hey, Google, play me some K-pop, and just like relax. And like I get it. Um, but they have been getting a lot of coverage lately for the security vectors, and like, are they always listening? But did you know that they are a really common abuse vector these days in domestic abuse cases? Um, this is something that I learned recently after reading a New York Times article. Um, so people have been, abusers have been controlling devices from their phone um, while people who they are abusing um, are, are present and they don't know how to turn off the like Nest or the Google Home when it's playing. Um, and it's a way to exert power and control over someone or to watch if you have a security camera, which, yeah, I have one too, and that could totally be used to abuse and um, assert power. And because a lot of this technology is so new, there isn't a lot of precedence legally, um, especially in like, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, restraining orders, restraining orders. Um, there's not a lot of precedence for this yet because the technology is so new. And I think this was a really salient quote from the article that I really enjoyed. It's, when we see new technology come out, people often think, wow, my life is going to be a lot safer. Um, but we often see the opposite with survivors of domestic violence. And again, things that we wouldn't have expected but if you remember that anything can be abused, um, it, well, it doesn't come as a surprise to me anymore, but um, I hope that really sticks. So enough of me talking about other abuse vectors. I'll, I'm just gonna dig into like GitHub's problems. Um, so maybe you might be familiar with Dr. Katie Bowman. This broke recently where she had led a team that created an algorithm that helped capture the first ever image of a black hole. Fucking cool. But a bunch, uh, bunch of people were going through the GitHub repos and trying to see if she actually did the work. Um, yeah, it's wild. I, I, I read the comments for you all, just so I could add the slide to the talk. Um, this was a very common sentiment. It's this Andrew guy wrote almost 400 times more code for this project than Katie. Um, and it turns out it's because of the way we display things on GitHub. This is the contributors graph for the algorithm on GitHub. Um, yeah, I guess that is 400 times more code. Um, and this is the contribution graph. We don't do a great job of showing other types of contributions. So again, I will tell you that any feature can be abused. And you need to also build the culture around um, the things that you're building to account for the impact of abuse. And of course, if users don't feel safe, they're going to leave. This person literally said, GitHub used to be fun for me, and now I avoid it at all costs um, for very similar reasons. And the reason why I really want to talk to you all today is because I think that designers have this power. It's literally what we're supposed to do, right? We're supposed to advocate for the user and empathize. And a, part, a big part of that is being able to account for these things before they happen and be able to minimize the impact. Um, yeah, so what do we do when everything seems like a raging dumpster fire? Um, I will say that like, I think online abuse is always going to be a problem as we keep building more and more technology. Um, 
but like I wouldn't be standing on the stage if I wasn't optimistic about it and haven't like thought about at least squashing maybe 80% of it. Um, but of course, I think that's something that more designers can incorporate into their foundational processes. So again, I'm just gonna reiterate this and viewing abuse through the lens of behavior has really helped us, and this is, the, this is the magical slide right here, everyone. This is the magic behind community and safety at GitHub and how we build safe features into the foundation of the product. Um, being able to create a tier of features along the spectrum has been amazing for us, and hopefully, um, if you all can define what that means for your, um, for your work, being able to protect from abuse vectors, discourage behavior, and encourage good online citizenship, I think we can all agree that this is something that we can do, um, just as any other principle in design. So for the protect side, this is my absolute favorite tool for creating safer, um, safer products. It's creating, this is a mouthful, stress case stories. Um, I really love that we've been talking a lot about user stories in the talks today. And um, to follow along that vein, I think that um, I've been referring to them as stress cases, which is from the book Technically Wrong. Again, I recommend reading this. Um, to better understand how users are feeling in particularly like scary situations, like trying to escape abuse. Um, my framework for doing this is what problems are they experiencing? How are they feeling? And what does success look like? Um, I, I don't know, I like to draw weird little cute comic thingies to demonstrate these user stories. Um, so I, I made one as an example of a user trying to escape a harassing uh, DMs from an ex, abusive ex. Um, it's just the, one of the problems that it's so easy to create new accounts and keep spamming them over and over with sock puppet accounts. And it's really like one of the greatest feelings that you can have is just the lack of control, um, feeling, fearing for your mental, personal, uh, physical safety at times. And success for them is making sure that support can um, react quickly, they can lock down their stuff, they can export for their privacy, that sort of thing. And I really enjoy getting like the entire team to draw these together with me. Um, so here I am forcing an engineer and the engineering manager to draw. Um, this is for an established contributor on GitHub, but it could be really for anything. And being able to document after is super important too. So once we've like had our fun sketching, I usually create a table in Markdown um, to list out the problems and the successes. You can also do this for, um, on the flip side, like not just for the person that's escaping abuse, but for the harasser or the abuser. Like what is their motivation? What is success for them? If we cut out the incentives for them, then we can hopefully close out some abuse vectors. Um, and these have been, this is a pure example of like me just taking that user story and creating a banner so that um, when you visit a repository for the first time, if there was someone that you blocked, you can opt in to warn you ahead of time in case um, you, know, you didn't want to participate. And definitely be sure to cover abusive partners and exes, stalkers, sexual harassers, fun stuff. Um, and you can see them. I, I like to put them with the like, non-safety personas as well in stories, um, just because like, they're all part of the same journey on your platform, right? They should not be separated out into like the safety corner. Um, another amazing practice is to ask for consent. This works on technology too. Um, my colleague, Danielle Leong, um, has consensualsoftware.com, which you can all learn about practices um, and how to integrate this into your technology. But it helps users feel like they're in control of their experience on a platform. Um, so a case study here for his repository <laughs> invitations. Um, I wasn't sure if I should include this, but I will anyway. Um, this is our, um, one of our founders, ex-CEO. Because of repository inv invitations in the past, anyone could invite anyone to your projects. They didn't have to consent in. And when you did that, you could attribute commit, uh, commits to them and then uh, hack their contribution graph. So Bitbucket is one of our competitors. <laughs> um, it, yeah, definitely fun. But you can imagine any other other horrible word. Um, 
So yeah, adding just a simple way to accept. Oh, I'm like out of time. Uh, hmm. I'm just gonna like quickly go go through these then. So the next one is to be able to discourage. Um, a really important part is being able to minimize the impact. And because any feature can be abused, make sure you're always including me uh, mechanisms to deal with unproductive content in worst case scenarios. So I did a refactor of all the places that we allow reporting abuse. You can see it's much more consistent. Um, so again, make sure you're using consistent visual affordances uh, to balance between like a salient dangerous action and using plain text buttons. Group from least to most aggressive. I'm really going through these now. OK, last part. Encourage. Encouraging good um, online citizenship. Um, it's one of the things that has helped us go from like 500 reviews reports a month to like 200 is being able to empower the community. Um, we want to make sure that maintainers are the ones that to discourage bad behavior. And um, you know, like think about your local communities. Like right now, this is a meetup, right? This is a community. Um, HOA, Pilates class, I don't know. Um, we all have like guidelines to participating, right? If I called you a jerk, that wouldn't be cool, right? And like the same should apply online as well. So we gave them a set of tiered moderation tools. Beforehand, there was only edit and delete on comments. So there were complaints on both sides, like why did this person have the power to edit my comment and change my words? Um, why did they delete my comments? I didn't get a notification. There was no timeline entry. So we gave a spectrum of tools to be able to deal with content in communities um, from the least destructive, like hiding, and all the way to the nuclear option, like blocking. Um, so this is a little bit, little demo of how that works. Just hide that you're a horrible cat. Let's look at a horrible comment. But it means that there's less intervention from support, and there's a way for maintainers to um, deal with content as they see fit. And turns out that rehabilitation is one of the most useful tools, too. When people feel that um, judgment is fair, they will totally take it and come back even more productive than before. So we added a way to temporarily block and send a notification about like what content was unacceptable in the community. Um, so last thing, being able to guide to productive expression. Uh, so we added a first-time contributor badge to help um, guide maintainers when they're looking at a pull request or something, that, hey, this person is new. Maybe you should treat them with a little bit more respect, do a little bit more hand-holding, and it helps them act accordingly. Um, we try to encourage thoughtfulness when engaging in a community. So like, hey, have you checked out the code of conduct for this community or the contributing guidelines? Um, and if you're looking for support, let's not open an issue and let's do this. It's much easier to understand community norms um, from the very beginning before you add words to a text box. We also added a community profile. It's a checklist for community maintainers to adopt best practices. Um, we had some research that showed that people feel more comfortable when there's documentation and um, a code of conduct, especially women in communities. So we just made it really easy to see that, ah, this is something that GitHub endorses. Let's add this and make our communities welcoming from the get-go with very little work. Um, plus one reactions, instead of like leaving a comment to add on noise, uh, one of my favorite things is we're trying to add more expressiveness to user profiles, and we have a product called GIST that we use um, to you know, like put notes. And one of my colleagues, Kathy Zhang, added this function to pin them. And you can see there's a lot more like creative expression. We're able to balance being able to express yourself um, while scoping it closely to something that we can monitor in case there is spam or eggplant pics or something. And I just love how people have been using it. Um, it's a, like I wouldn't have expected this if we completely said, no, we're cutting off people's um, venues of expression, right? So there's definitely a balance there. And I think it's totally achievable. Um, so far, no eggplants that I've heard of. Um, yeah, got to the end. So <laughs> I would love to leave you with this again. How can this feature be used to harm someone? Um, just because I fully believe, and like one of the reasons why I like tried to get over my pu public speaking fear to come here is because I really think that this can grow as a practice, similar to like accessibility, responsive design, and I think it should be 
um, a foundational part of our processes, just like empathy, simplicity, and collaboration. So I invite you all to think about this more critically, too. Um, yeah, so some shout outs, some thank yous. Slides were by my amazing coworker, Ash. He's a super rad graphic designer. And that's me. And that's the OctaCat that I made. We have an OctaCat generator. So um, yeah, please follow me on the things, and we can chat after, too. Thank you. Thank you.